195. Page number 195, and we will sing this two times through. to page number 227. Page number 227. Thank you, Lord, that we're not in bondage of our sins and bound for hell anymore. 
Thank you, Lord, for paying our sin debt in full past, praise in the end, future. We pray, Lord, that you'll uh, prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word here today. And we will allow your word to work in us and through us, Lord, that we may know you more and have a closer walk with you, Lord. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to empty us of us, Lord, in this world that we live in, that you may fill us with your word and with your will. We do ask, Lord, if there's one among us that does not know you as Savior today, be that day they come to know you and your salvation. Pray, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to your name here today with all that we do and say. We ask, Lord, to take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Let's all stand together. Turn over to page number 173. It's hard to sing this one sitting down. <laughs> Let's all turn over to page number 115. Page number 115, and after the first verse, we'll go around and welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Thank you. 
making our way back to our seat, page number 116, we'll, or page 115, we'll sing that last verse. Every day he comes to me with new assurance, more and more I understand his words of love, but I'm not sure just how he came to save me, so someday I'll be with his face above. No one ever cared for me. be seated. Turn over one more this morning to page number 237. Page 237. Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, throwing the piano player under the under the bus. <clears throat> so let's have uh, first five men. First five men volunteers. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. All right. <clears throat> there we go. Three ninety-seven. Bring your songbook. You can come on up, brother. Come on. You're good. We'll take seven. <laughs> Amen. There we go. Amen. So we got this mic on. So everybody hover around here. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. So three, three ninety-seven. <clears throat> Ready? Oh yeah. There we go.
All right. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Amen. We got a new deal going. Amen. That's great. That's good. <laughs> All right. Genesis chapter number four this morning. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number four. Appreciate Sister Kaylin playing. <clears throat> and then just getting the, the special thrown right out there. So that was great. I think she looked in the in the songbook and the page wasn't even there. So she's just she's just playing from memory. So that was that was good news. Amen. Made it all happen. Boy, the Lord is in it. Amen. Genesis chapter number four. Whenever you find your place, I'll invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word <clears throat> this morning. In Genesis chapter four, we're going to begin in verse number one. Genesis 4, verse number 1, says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And, it came to, uh, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And go all the way down to verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed, uh, he, for God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to, who, to him also there was born a son, and called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. I want to bring our message this morning of encouragement for the day. Encouragement for the day. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this day that you've given us and for the opportunity that you allow us to be able to come into your house, to be able to gather with the believers and, and brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, just the fellowship that you give. We want to thank you for that. Thank you for this church. Lord, we pray, Father, that as we go through this passage that you would speak to hearts and help us, Lord, just to be encouraged in this day that we're in, to be able to know that you're in control of all things, Lord, and that you're doing a mighty work. So Lord, I pray, Father, that we're attentive to your word and, and, Lord, the moving of your spirit and everything that you want to show us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. If there's one here that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they come to know you. Lord, that they would trust, put their trust in you and, and Lord, stop depending upon self. But, Lord, to be able to receive that wonderful free gift. We just want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. I was reading through this week in verse number 26. I love it. It says that then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the first time that it's mentioned in Scripture of men calling upon the Lord. First time in Scripture. Now certainly there was communion with the Lord beforehand. We saw that whenever God uh, created Adam and Eve. There was a fellowship that was there. There was a kinship. God would come down. He would walk in the cool of the day with, uh, with Adam and Eve. And, and uh, that fellowship was broken though because of sin. And of course there's always repercussions uh, because of sin. There was the expulsion from the, uh, from the garden. There was the effects of, of sin that would be passed on to, to men and to women. We understand the uh, women would know the pain of, of childbearing and then the men were uh, laboring with the, uh, by the sweat of their brow amongst the thorns and the thistles and, and, uh, and then of course their own personal relationship between man and woman was also corrupted during that time. And so God restored the ability to fellowship with Him by the shedding of blood of an innocent animal. Remember Adam and Eve tried to uh, cover their own sin. They tried to make the fig leaves. They looked. They saw that they were naked. They tried to uh, do something to be able to cover themselves. Didn't work at all. And uh, God had to step in and He uh, brought about the, the death of that animal. Remember innocent blood was shed for the very first time because of sin. And uh, so He was, after that He was no longer coming and walking with them in the cool of the day. But He did show them the way that there could be an atonement. He showed them the way that they could restore that fellowship. And, and it was by the the, the providing of a covering for the guilty. But it was here in chapter number four that it's first mentioned about men calling upon the name of the Lord. So what exactly does that mean? What is it talking about there? That word call here, it means that the people began to disclose who they really were. 
That's what was taking place. They were confessing their need of something beside themselves. They were inviting God to take a lead part in their life. It, it wasn't enough for them to try to walk through that world by themselves. They could see all the evil that was there. They recognized the need that, uh, to, to be able to have that close communion and fellowship with a holy God. You know, wouldn't you like to see that today? Uh, man, I'd love to see America return to that and, and have that same desire to call upon the name of the Lord. How does it start? Where does it start? It starts in churches, just like a church, just like this right here. It starts in a day, just like today. You say, well, why hasn't it started? Uh, you know, that's a good question because God hasn't changed. Amen? God still makes the way. God's still just as willing and ready to be able to show Himself strong in our weakness. He's just as desirous for His people to be on fire for Him. Maybe we hadn't made that connection between the days of Seth and the days that we're in today. And until we come to the end of ourselves, until we see things the way that God sees them, all around us today we will probably stay in the same condition that we're in. You ever wondered why it is that God gives such details in Scripture? I mean, there's, there's such, there, I, I mean, think about this. If you, were, uh, if you were just to pin the highlights of the Bible, man, you could go through the creation account, the life of Moses. You could probably get all the way up to the life of David in three to four pages if you just had the high points. But God didn't do that. He included so much detail. He wanted us to so, see so many of the things that were transpiring. Why was that? Probably because he wants us to read it. Amen. He wants us to see it. He wants us to understand the condition that we're in as people. He wants us to be able to see the holiness of our God. Uh, he wants us to be able to see just how much we resemble the things of the past. He tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verse number 2, that men should be lovers of their own selves. Talking about in the last days perilous times shall come. We understand those verses, and, and the closer to the Lord's return uh, that comes, the more that we go back to those verses and say, boy, it's perilous times. Can I tell you, it's been perilous times ever since Jesus ascended back up to, to heaven. Amen? Those are, the, those are the last days. Started at the crucifixion. From that point on, we have been in the last days. And it continues to get farther and farther away from God. And he says the condition is men should be lovers of their own selves. He goes on in 2 Timothy verse number 4 of chapter 3. He says lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And as long as that's the case, there will not be the desire of men to call upon the name of the Lord. Right. As long as there's more interest in pleasure, as long as there's more interest in self, then we won't get to the point where men recognize that there's a holy God who wants a fellowship and communion with them. That's what makes the times perilous. But it was certainly, uh, as we think about those times, it's not unprecedented. As a matter of fact, all the way back here in Genesis chapter number 4, we start seeing those same, same things that are taking place. We start to see what it looks like whenever sin takes root in a society. That's what chapter 4 is all about. You're starting to see that, that detraction, that defunction away from the things of God and the Word of God and how much that it begins to prevail and how much that, that sin gets enveloped into the life of people and what happens whenever those roots are established. And we see it all played out and we see it through Cain and Abel. I want you to notice just a few things as we think about those days. First of all, there's the, the state of the people. The state of the people. I want us to be able to get to uh, understand what it means to be able to call upon the name of the Lord, as we see in verse number 26. But again, we'll never get to verse number 26 if we don't see the state of what's going on beforehand. So if we understand a little bit about that, maybe we'll get to the same point there in verse number 26. So uh, first off, whenever you're looking at the state of the people, there's a few uh, major characteristic things that are, uh, that are taking a decline away from the things of God and what it is that God had established. The first being that of worship. There was a degradation of worship. Verse number 3, it says, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. 
Now it's pretty interesting here. So Cain is the oldest. He's the firstborn uh, of, of Eve. It may have been whenever uh, that Cain was born, Eve was already looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise that, that he gave all the way back in chapter 3, verse number 15. Talking about that seed of the woman's going to come, crush the head of Satan. And so you already see that there's two lines that are getting established way back then. There's going to be a lineage, a line of Satan, and there's going to be a line of God. And that line of God is going to bring forth the Messiah who is going to deliver the people from their sin. Every sacrifice that took place in the Old Testament was a testimony looking forward to the Messiah that was going to come to be the ultimate sacrifice. It was always a matter of faith in the one that God would provide. And that was the testimony, that was the direction that was, uh, that was going on. So maybe uh, whenever uh, Eve had Cain, she was already thinking, here he comes. This is going to be the direction because look at what she says in verse number 1. Uh, she conceived, she, she bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Yep. Amen. She's like, look at here. Here comes the answer. Then she has another boy. And that one she named Abel. Uh, Abel became this great man of faith. He's the very first person that you see listed in Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith hall of fame. He's the first one that gets called out in that lineage of faithful men. These boys, they begin to grow into to manhood, and, and Cain becomes a farmer. Uh, Abel becomes a shepherd. Both of those positions are great. Both of them are honorable positions. Cain was following in dad's footsteps. Remember, uh, Adam, he was, uh, he was a tiller of the ground as well. Amen. He was, man, he knew all about the gardening, and that was the direction that Cain went. I can see him out there following after Adam, toiling. There's a lot of work involved, sweat of the brow, getting rid of the thorns and the thistles. He's pointing to him. He says, listen, boy, uh, this is because of me, but you've got to get rid of it. And he's and you got to get all that stuff out of there. So he's doing all that. And then Abel, uh, Abel becomes a, a shepherd. Abel's, uh, and think about the importance of both of those. Uh, Cain, he's going to be able to, he's got the gardening, he's got the food supply that's coming out that the people are going to eat. His people, his, his family are going to be eating from his garden. And then you got Abel. Abel's a shepherd. He's guiding around the sheep. What good is that? Well, they're going to have clothes. Amen. Uh, they're going to be able to, to, to manufacture that. They're going to be able to have sacrifice. So what about lamb chops? Not till after the flood. They weren't eating the sheep. That's not what they were for. There was, there was provision for sacrifice. That was a provision to be able to come and meet with God. So in verses 3 through 5, we've got this comparison of worship. We've got both of these boys, and they're, they're, they're coming to God. They're getting to this understanding, hey, we need to approach God. They've seen worship. They know what's involved in worship. And look at it again real quick. Verse number 3 says, In process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now what was taking place here? Whenever you look at what's happening in these verses, you've got a contrast. You have a God-centered worship versus a man-centered worship. Amen. That's the direction that is really taking place here. Uh, see, Real worship is a God-centered worship. It's coming to God in the way that God says. Real worship comes with the understanding that there is a personal need. There is a personal guilt. There is an understanding that we're not good enough to be able to attain all that, that needs to be attained on our own. We're helpless to be able to meet that need. And we have a complete dependence upon God alone. That's what real worship is about. Real worship is not about the appeal of the visual appetites of man. Now this is a struggle that still goes on today whenever we start thinking about worship. There's a lot of things that go on in the house of God or in churches uh, that don't have anything to do with God whatsoever. It's a man driven. It's a man focused. This is my preferences. And, and all of a sudden our preferences often take the, the, uh, the distinction away from what it is that God says is, is His manner of worship. Honestly, what should we be concerned with whenever we come into the house of God? We are sinners. God is a holy God, and we need fellowship with Him. Yeah. 
That should be the underlying motivation every time we come into the house of God. It should be our heart's desire uh, to be able to have a good, sweet communion with the holy God, recognizing that he is in control, he's guiding our steps, he's, he's directing our paths, and we're just humbling ourselves to him. It's not about your preference of music. It's not about what you, what you prefer about whether the preacher wears a tie or whether he wears a T-shirt. Although oh, I got my preferences and all. You got your preferences, amen. Uh, but it's a matter of saying, hey, we need to approach God and whenever we understand that we as sinful man are coming to a holy God then it's going to have a great direction on what is deemed as appropriate in worship if it's man centered it's not going to help us there has to be the submission of human pride to a holy God before it is a God centered worship the attitude of the heart toward the will of God is going to determine the acceptability of true worship if a person uh, willingly accepts God's word and approaches him on the basis of faith in God's provision you know what's going to happen there's going to be a sweet fellowship with God that's what it is that God can do but if the person if, if that personal uh, will of man counts for more than God's direction if, if the interest, whenever we come to worship, both, both people, you know, looking at both of them, they're both coming to worship. Amen? But if one is more directed toward their, their own personal interest rather than God's direction, guess what that means? Look at it back in chapter 3 real quick. Chapter 3, verse number 5. Here's Satan. He's tempting Eve. Guess what it is that he tells her? He says, For God doth know in the, day you, in the day that you eat thereof, talking about that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God said you should not eat. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He says, No, no. He just doesn't want you to get this. He says, Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, uh, he was very right about that. He was sure enough right. He said, Whenever you eat it, all they knew before was good. He said, but whenever you disobey God, whenever you sin against God, you'll, you'll still remember the good, but you'll also know evil, something that God doesn't ever want you to know. Amen. Now, whenever we come before God, and we start thinking about worship of God, there is a God-centered way where we're going to come in accordance with Him, recognizing His holiness, our sinfulness, and our great need for Him to be so close in, in our lives as a child of God. Amen. Or whenever we come based on our own flesh and our own desires, guess what we're doing? We're saying that, uh, that, that our eyes are, are open to uh, these things. We're kind of presuming that we're going to be as God's knowing good and evil. And we're saying, listen, I know what's good enough. I know what I like to see. What are we doing? We're fulfilling what Satan said in the very beginning. He says, whenever you get your eyes off of God, guess what? He said, you'll direct your own path. <clears throat> All of a sudden we start falling for Satan's lies. We start presuming that we don't really need God. Or that the worship that we do is good enough for God. And I tell you, that's what you see taking place today. There are people, or there are things that are people's desire, but it's opposed to what it is that God wants. Before we ever start calling out on the name of God again, we'll have to come to the understanding that what God says goes. He's the one that sets the precedence. He's the one that's most important. Whenever you look at Cain and Abel, you can see both of these men, they knew about worship. They knew that there was a place where worship was taking place. Right? It says they both brought of their their offerings. They both brought their, their sacrifices there. Uh, they didn't just say, this is as good a place as any. God, if you want it, it's over here in the corner. They recognized there was a place where they were going to go, a place that was going to be separate from everywhere else where they were going to come to God. There was a time that says in the process of time they brought their offerings. They recognized there was a time that they were to go and they were to, to worship God. And there was also the instruction of what it was that was acceptable in the eyes of God. Amen. I guarantee you, God did not leave Adam and Eve just to figure it out on their own. He didn't say, good, you got your set of clothes, see you around. No, he still wanted to have the fellowship. That's why he, he gave them the promise. He said the Messiah is going to come. That, that one, he, he, listen, there is one that's going to come that is going to, des to destroy uh, the very head of Satan. He's going to crush his head. He said, listen, uh, recognize what's taking place here. I, I got a plan working. He wants to be able to maintain that sweet fellowship with man. He would tell them the way to do it. How's it going to happen? By the blood. By the blood. 
It was a constant testimony throughout Scripture. Whenever man is going to approach God, it had to be by the blood. Guess what Adam and Eve doing? They're, they're passing that on to their kids. Amen. In Hebrews 11 verse 4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it by uh, the dead yet speaketh. He says, by faith Abel offered that sacrifice. What is that? That was the faith of exactly what God was coming to do, what he was, uh, who He was going to send. He says, I had faith in the coming Messiah. His, his offering was inspired by faith in what? In what God wanted. That's what He was about. So God's desire was certainly known. I would imagine if they, if they haven't offered that sacrifice themselves, if this was the first time that they had done it personally, we're not told, but I guarantee you they've seen it before. They knew exactly what it was that God had directed. Before in the past there had been no issue at all. But one day Cain says, I'm going to do it my way. Uh -huh. Cain says, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Now get this, Cain was not an atheist. Amen. He didn't say, I don't think there is a God. No, he was bringing his sacrifice, but it was to his own liking. He offered, uh, there's a couple of problems, he offered a bloodless sacrifice. Now I'm certain, I'm certain this was a wonderful presentation of vegetables. I'm certain it was a sacrifice. I mean, that was something that he could have eaten. His family could have eaten. He, he could have used it. He could have canned it or whatever they do. Man, he could have taken care of it. He brings it. It's going to be nice. It's going to be tidy. It's going to be pretty. I guarantee it's a beautiful offering. Can I tell you, sin is not. Sin is not nice. It's not pretty. It's not tidy. And the redemption for the sins of man was not pretty either. Whenever Jesus came to this sin-cursed world, he came and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice. Yeah. He, he took on the, the abuse. He took all of the spitting. He took the, his beard was plucked out. His, his back was laid open. He was crucified. He was put on the cross at Calvary. The Bible says he became our sin so that the redemption of man could be, or the redemption of God could be passed on to man. He did that for us. It wasn't pretty. His offering, Cain's offering, it was a bloodless sacrifice. Secondly, his offering was the product of his own labor. Listen, it came from the cultivation of a sin-cursed ground. God told Adam, he says, that ground is cursed. Now here's the problem. Uh, whenever somebody tries to come to God their own way, whenever they just try to say, you know, I, I think I'm, I, I'm going to do what I think is best. I think we should all just kind of hang in there. You know, I think I've got a good way that I'm going to get to God. I'm going to try to be good enough. Guess what? It's still coming from a cursed ground. It's coming from a cursed substrate. It's coming from sinful flesh. There is nothing that you could do in your own flesh to be able to get to God because you're starting off with sinful flesh. That sin has to be remedied. The righteousness of God has to be applied. In a sin-cursed world, worship is to be a priority, and it has to be in the manner that is prescribed by God. We're a corrupt people because of sin. And if worship is going to be accepted then it has to be by God's direction, by God's prescription, not by man's. Amen. So then you look at it and you're like, all right, that seems easy enough. What happened to Cain? What happened with Cain? I'll tell you what happened. Rebellion. Yeah. Rebellion happened to Cain. He thought that his fruit was just as valuable as Abel's lamb. He starts looking at it. He's like, man, I don't see the big difference here. He said, man, this, this took as much work out of me as it did for you. But it wasn't what God had said was acceptable. There was actually, uh, the more that, well, whenever this happened, there was this build of, of, of animosity toward Abel. He's looking at Abel and he's like, man, I can't believe you. He said, God accepted you and you sorry old sheep. Man, I, I mean, nobody even likes sheep. You ever been around sheep? It's not like, nobody says, I wish I had a few of those for a pet. No, they're not. He, and Abel's like, man, look at all my vegetables. This is great. Or Cain is, and he, said, he looks at Abel and he says, your offering is no better than mine. And he begins to get so built up, that animosity toward Abel so much so it began to fester in his life. And the whole while, God gives him more and more opportunity. He says, listen, man. He said, you can still make it right. Yep. You can still make it right. It'll still be acceptable. All you got to do is make it right. All you got to do is be obedient. 
What do you have to do to be obedient in that state? Give up your pride. You got to put your, your pride and your ideas away and say, God is in control, not me. Man, he, think about this. He could have made it right so much easier. He could have just said, it's like, Abel, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have gone through, man, I am being dumb. I know what God wants. My fault. Would you forgive me on that? Guarantee you, Abel say, man, right on. No problem. I got you. I got your sheep right over here. Man, he would have been able to take care of all of that, but Cain held on to his pride, and his worship became meaningless. We look at what's going on and why there's lack of worship. A lot of times it just kind of degrades because people hang on to their pride rather than coming with the full recognition, I need a Savior. I need to come to God the way that God says. I need to humble myself. I need to put myself on the back burner and come to Him. Second thing that you see taking place during this time was the collapse of the family. The collapse of the family. Now don't, don't mistake in this. Whenever you start seeing uh, the way worship prevails or degrades, it's going to carry over to the home. Every time it will. Now look at what happens in verse number 8. It says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. That sounds good. Let, uh, Abel, let's talk. All right? And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. He could have spoken to Abel about a sheep, but instead he determined that he would secure his rights. And he said, I'll just eliminate the competition. Yep. What do you think about that? See, the issue was, was not with Abel, but Cain is like most people driven by their flesh. He lashed out at a person but the real issue was between him and God. And Abel took the brunt of it. But it was still the issue that he had. See, the Lord knew the issue of the heart. The Lord tries to point him in the right direction, but it was Cain's choice of how it is that he responds to God. I'll tell you, uh, in the home, whenever there's a problem between a husband and a wife, when your marriage is on the rocks and it's going to pot, the real problems between you and God every time. If a husband has a right relationship with God and the wife has a right relationship with God, you'll be able to work through anything even whenever you're looking at one another's faults. You don't know what they did. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're looking past that and you're saying, hey, by the glory of God, for the glory of God, we're going to accomplish this. We're going to do something great for God. We're going to put differences aside. We're going to look, because we're looking to Him. That's what's going to be able to set the pattern in our life, in our homes, our families. So he rejected God's grace, and he continues on in his rebellion. Now think about this. Right about there, this is where a lot of times, this is, this is where we are as, as Christians. That's the decision point that we're at. I know what God wants, but... Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. I know what God says about this, but, you know, and, and right there, that's the decision that Cain enables at, at this point. It's the decision that Cain is at. Uh, Cain decides, he's like, you know, I know what God wants, but I'm just tired of hearing Abel. Every time I look over there, he's just over there, you know, petting his sheep like he's got something special. He's like, oh, I'm tired of that, Abel. You're going down, Abel. Probably used a shovel, kabink, you know. But he's looking at it, and he says... Now, here's the point. Did it get better or worse? You bet. Man, it started this great decline. Sin always takes you farther away than where you need to be. He ends up, think about it, he killed his brother. Killed his brother. We're given some, we're given some insight. Uh, turn with me real quick over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter number 3. Abel... Uh, Abel wasn't killed because of the father's favoritism. He wasn't killed because he had a bad attitude. Look at what happens. 1 John chapter 3, and look down to verse 11. <clears throat> 11 and 12, it says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Why did he do it? Here it is. Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Yes. Now, I love that because he says, he's of the wicked one. 
What's he saying? He's, fell, he's fallen into a satanic characteristic. Now you remember whenever we started, uh, look at Genesis chapter number 3, remember there's two l lines that were going in place. There was two seeds that were going to be happening. There was a lineage of Satan. There was going to be a lineage from God. And he said those two are contrary. And he says he was of the wicked one. His own works were evil. His brother's righteous. And he says I'm taking him out. A brother killed another brother because of his rebellion to God. We don't think about it very often. Can you imagine what that would have done to Adam and Eve? Can you imagine them sitting there seeing this whole thing unfold? They're still there. They're still watching all this. And you can rest assured they understand that came because of their own decision. They said, look at what it is that we have started. Look at what's been going on <clears throat> in the people as a result of their sin. You know, Satan has a field day tearing apart families when pride keeps us away from the will of God. So there's a degradation of worship, there's a collapse of the family. Thirdly, in the people here there's a shamelessness towards sin. There's a shamelessness towards sin. Look back in chapter number 4 verse number 9, the Lord said unto Cain, where's Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? God spoke to Cain in the same way that he spoke to Adam. Isn't that great? Remember whenever Adam sinned, what did God do? God came along, where art thou, Adam? What did he do? He asked a question. He knew exactly where Adam was. He knew, uh, he, he knew what was taking place in Adam's life, but he was giving Adam the opportunity to say, I sin. Yep. He was giving him the opportunity to confess and to be able to make it right, and sure enough there was redemption, there was atonement uh, that came whenever he admitted it. He comes to Cain, same situation. He presents him with a question. He, he looks at him, he says, hey, uh, uh, where's thy brother? He didn't get the same kind of answer. Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? He's getting smart with God. He says, is it my job to be keeping up with him? There's an animosity that's there. Whenever there's no reverence to approach God the way that God wanted, then there's a demeaning attitude toward God. Why is that? Because there's no fear of God. That's what's going on in Cain's life. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Man, he's giving him the opportunity. Where's your brother? Why don't you keep up with him? Why are you asking me? Listen, does that sound like a heart of worship? Does that sound like any interest whatsoever, being able to say, here I, I'm just fallen. I'm just fallen, sinful man. You're the almighty God. There's none of that. It's just complete disrespect and lack of fear. And because he didn't fear God, he wouldn't have a repentant heart. There'd be no confession of sin. Instead, what did he do? Just wanted to cover it. Just covered it. I don't know where he's at. Yep. I don't know. You know, an unrepentant heart will always seek to cover sin instead of bringing it to God Amen. for forgiveness. Every time. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, here's the deal. God doesn't let it go. God doesn't say, oh man, I, you, you're probably just a little upset. Now look at what he says in verse number 10. He said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. He says, I know everything that you did. He said, That blood is a testimony against you. Verse 12, he says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. With the judgment, the thing that Cain prided himself in doing. He prided himself in, in the fruit of the ground. He said, not anymore. The thing that you thought was the most glorious thing about you, you won't be able to do anymore. That's right. He said, instead, you're going to be a wanderer in life. He says in verse number 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Land of Nod, it means land of wandering. What's, what's he doing? What's Cain doing? He's seeking, never satisfied. Amen. Never fulfilled in his life. And notice Cain's response here, verse number 13. Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore... 
Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. He says, I'm not going to let you off easy. It'd be easy for you to die. But he says, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that you're not to be touched. You're, dealing, you're being dealt with by me. He believed, uh, Cain's looking at that, and he believed his punishment was too great to handle. Isn't it interesting? He didn't say, my sin is ever before me. My sin is too great for me to handle. I cannot believe that I sinned in this way against my God and my family. There was no repentance, no remorse. What did he have? He had resentment toward God. It's interesting, that's exactly what's taking place in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 16, verse number 9, during the tribulation, uh, those that were uh, getting to understand something about the wrath of God, it says, And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. 16.11 says, They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. It wasn't a matter of, of, of their own actions, their own deeds. They didn't look at it and say, Man, we, we have sinned against the holy God. And all of a sudden he's just complaining because the punishment was too tough. So that was the state of the people. Secondly, I want you to notice the choice the choice of the people. Go down to verse number 25 where we were. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, For goodness, for God said she, hath anointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. I love that little phrase there that I keep messing up. Said she. Said she. She's making this statement here. For God said she. It was Eve's confession. What was she confessing? What God started, he's going to finish. Whatever God said, he's going to accomplish. Eve had watched this whole thing unfold. She's seen the two directions that can go in life. She could see the results of it. She saw what happens whenever you follow God's way. She sees what happens whenever you follow the way of Satan. There were the ungodly and the godly. And we'll see it on our Wednesday night study through Jude. It'll come up a little bit more later. But there's a big difference whenever you start to see what happens in the lineage whenever you're getting away from God or staying with God. Amen. And you can see it in, in what happens in the, in the people. Remember that anytime you start seeing that number seven there, it's talking about the completion. There's a, there's a, a completing factor. Whenever you go that seventh generation down the line, where's it end? If you look back up in verse number 23... The seventh in Cain's line in verse number 23 was Lamech. And it says in verse number 23, it says, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. Here's a man who's totally against God. Verse number 24 says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. He's a man who's proud in his sin. He says, you think Cain got some trespass? You, you think Cain had some judgment against him? He says, you wait. Boy, you just see what God's going to do. He was proud of his sin. He shakes his fist at God. That's what happens in that line. You go through the other way. You got the seventh through the lineage of Seth. Who do you get? Chapter 5, and look at verse twenty. Four. The seventh through the line of Seth is Enoch. Enoch. Verse 24 of chapter 5 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Isn't it amazing how you start seeing the difference? You got one that's shaking their, their, their fist at God, just like it was at Revelation 16. You got the, you got the other that says, walked with God. Remember, that, that's representative of, of a whole uh, a group, a whole time of people. Who was Enoch? Who, what does that represent? The rapture of the church. Remember, uh, Enoch, you got Methuselah there. Methuselah, remember his name, it, it means, uh, uh, what is it? When, uh, when he dies, it shall come. And it's talking about that judgment. Whenever Methuselah died, that's whenever God judged the earth and brought about that great flood from Noah. Right? Which, by the way, is such a great testimony. Remember your, your trivial your trivia history there of, of Methuselah, oldest man. What does that testify? The very long suffering of God for judgment. The one who says, listen, the very long, the longest one recorded, he says, whenever it 
Uh, whenever he dies, it shall come. And the long-suffering of God, he's, he's given them opportunity, given them opportunity, given them opportunity. A lot of times people look at Noah's ark and they think, oh, that's a, that's a picture of God and, and carrying his church on through. No, it's not. Enoch is the picture of the church. They're raptured out before the judgment. Yep. Amen. And then all of a sudden when Methuselah dies, then God in his protection is going to take care of the Jews through the time of tribulation. This is, don't, don't confuse your spots. Now think about the difference that's here. Lamech, he's over here shaking his fist at God just like those during the tribulation time. Instead of repenting of their deeds, they just continue to curse God. Meanwhile, God's people are removed out. And you see it way back here in Genesis chapter number 4. And you start looking at the people and they're like, wait a minute, there's something special here about coming to God in the way that God prescribes. It all kind of, man, it all falls apart. Whenever you say, I'll do my own bidding, I'll do things my own way, I'll come to God any way that I feel like it. He's, he tells us in Scripture, he says, get to the end of the matter. Find out where it really ends up. In the day that we're in, now get this, our world is a lot like Lamech. The things that we see around us, we look at it and we're like, how in the world could we be at this point? How did we get that choices were made? Whenever you, whenever you choose your group, when you choose whether or not you're going to follow God or you're going to follow self, you're choosing your course. You're seeing what's going to unfold. So there's the state of the people, the choice of the people. Finally, we get to the call of the people. Look at what he says in verse number 26. So all of this is transpiring. There's this degradation of worship. There's the uh, collapse of family. There's all these things that are going about. We're seeing the culmination of it all. In verse number 26, it says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. He called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Then. Whenever it seems like things were at the worst, the full culmination of all the bad decisions, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. When the times were perilous in the world, guess what happens? There's a great revival of God's people. There was a great interest again on the things of God. They found it necessary to get back to God. Why do we see all the depravity today? Why are all these things happening? Why is there a pride parade in Lufkin, Texas? How did, that, how did that ever get here? How is it that, that government is saying that monkeypox is the new thing whenever it's spread through homosexual men? Now all of a sudden it's a, it's a national, uh, national interest, a national pandemic. Everybody go, get ready. You're going to have to get your vaccine pretty soon. Why is it that all these things transpire? And, and you look at it like, how in the world did we get to that point? How can people be so gullible, and, quite honestly, so deceived? Yeah. Yeah. Choices. Yes. And it may be, so God will say, the need is for men mm -hmm. to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Maybe he allows us to see it so that we'll be shaken a bit and stop making life about ourselves and saying we have a holy God who desires to be approached and who wants to be the God of our nation, the God of this world. And He is, regardless of whether you try to, whether you think He's on the throne or not, He's there. Amen. May we, we need to approach Him in prayer, humbling ourselves to Him. Maybe He's saying, here's one more opportunity that I'm giving you to be able to come to me. I hope you stay encouraged in the Lord whenever you see the sinfulness of man. That's the whole point. The whole point of the whole deal. Sorry to get you all that way. I could have just told you in two minutes we'd have been done. Y'all have been home eating fried chicken right now. Stay encouraged in the Lord. You see, as everything else seems to be going bad, it's a wrong group. That's not your group. Amen. Come to God. Recognize Him on the throne. Honor Him. Come the way that He wants. Align your life in the way that He wants. See His hand and, and His blessing in your time of worship. See His hand and His blessing in your home and your family and your kids. Start watching what it is that God can do instead of getting our eyes focused on the things of the world that are so against God. This is the time where God's people can truly be revived. Our times 
Our times today aren't really any different than what was taking place in Genesis chapter 4. Not that much different. Still two groups. One group wants to honor the Lord. They desire to worship the way that God said. They want their families to stay close to God. They want a pure heart for God. They, they know the only way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the other group is the, those that want to be able to live for themselves. They think, you know, my way is just as good as God's way. There's a minimizing of the Word of God, and there's going to be a suffering of the judgment of a holy God. The choice is still for us today. God still gives us the opportunity to choose today. You can choose to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning. You can choose to align your life with the Word of God and say, God gave it to us on purpose. Amen. This is what it is that He desires. Today, honestly, today could be a great reviving of God's people. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Father, we want to thank You for today. Thank You for Your love and blessings. Thank You for Your goodness to us. And Lord, how much that You show us in Scripture. How much You want us to see all the details and the things of, of, of how things come about. Lord, you, you give us all these things to be able to allow us to see the end of the matter. Lord, to be able to examine our hearts and our lives. Lord, to be able to look around at the world around us and recognize that Satan is still working, but, but you are so much greater. Lord, you give us today to be able to humble ourselves and, and come before you to worship you, to have you first in our hearts and lives and homes. Lord, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, to be able to see that you made a way of atonement, a way to reconcile what was wrong. Lord, it took the shed blood of the perfect sacrifice. And Lord, I pray, Father, that each of us that do know you as Savior would humble ourselves to you and say, not my will, but thine be done. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you want to do in this time of invitation. I pray, God, that you would have your perfect work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page number 277. 277. You need to